Hi and welcome to our Conceived Baby discussion today. Today we'll be talking about a topic that we really don't talk enough about in relation to fertility. And I think a big reason for that is there's, a, there's quite a belief that uh, be a matter of the mind means it's all in your head. And that's certainly not the case. It's really about recognising and understanding that the mind and the body do work together. And you can use the power of the mind to positively influence the body, influence fertility and pregnancy outcomes. And today we'll be discussing exactly how you go about that. So firstly, for those of you who haven't joined us before, my name's Tasha Jennings, founder of Conceive Baby. I'm a naturopath, nutritionist, natural fertility specialist and author of The Vitamins Guide and The Fertility Diet as well as an expert contributor for major media publications such as The Herald Sun, The Age, The New Idea, Yahoo 7, as well as other pregnancy and parenting websites. I'm also the director of Zycia. Now, Zycia means life and specialises in premium prenatal supplementation to promote and support life in its earlier stages. And as many of you who are already part of the Conceived Baby community would know, I am passionate about helping couples fall pregnant and have happy, healthy babies. My aim for conceivebaby.com.au is to really bring together a team of specialists across all aspects of fertility and preconception health to provide you with qualified expert information to help you achieve your baby dreams. And today I'll be speaking with a valued member of that expert panel, fertility psychologist, Kath Corcoran. Now Kath is an experienced psychologist in both the clinical and the counselling setting. After 15 years as a psychologist, working for major hospitals, including the Royal Children's Hospital here in Melbourne, Kath now works exclusively with couples wanting to have children, both through IVF and also trying naturally. Kath has also provided expert comment for and contribution for Essential Baby, the Sydney Morning Herald, SBS Life and Kidspot, just to name a few. Kath is a firm believer in the mind-body connection and treating the body as a whole, not as just isolated systems. And she works closely with other fertility specialists to help achieve the best outcomes for her patients. So welcome, Kath. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Tasha. No, it's really, really pleased to have you on board. So I think it's something, as I mentioned, um, that we don't talk about enough. And I guess I'd firstly like to, to, to help dispel that myth. We often talk about the involvement of the mind, I guess, in any ailment, uh, physical ailment. And we do think, what do you mean? That's all in my head. Help us dispel that myth. What is it all about, the mind-body connection? Yeah, okay, yeah, really important. Um, I still find it hard that people uh, can't connect that our body is a whole system, that it's not isolated, that we can't just say something's physical or we can't just say something's mental. Um, and I think the difficulty here is that there's a lot of stigma involved if we say that something has uh, that something that's related mentally to uh, any physical ailment. So I suppose what I feel my job to do is to break down the barriers about what uh, your mental uh, health and impact that can have on the journey. Um, as you said, I like to think of it in, as the, the mind-body connection. And I look at it, I suppose, from a biopsychosocial model so that we have a biological component, we have a psychological component, and then we have the social component part of it. And that's how we show that it's all interconnected. As you touched on, uh, it's about each system um, being integrated together so that your just as your skeletal system wouldn't work by itself, um, it needs a circulatory system to actually uh, provide the blood and the cells to make the skeleton work, um, just as the mind and body are connected as well. So any thought that we may have actually triggers off a biological connection. So that if you're feeling happy, the happy hormones flow through your body. If you're feeling stressed, obviously the stress hormones flow through your body. So that's 
that I suppose in a nutshell is what how the mind and body can connect to the fertility journey. So it's actually quite a stressful journey for many people. So therefore, the stress that we may have will impact our biological and physiological response uh, in the fertility journey. Um, I like to think that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach so that each individual person has their own individual fingerprint, so their own mind-body presentation. Uh, and it's about each of those individuals unravelling the biological component and, and then the psychological component. So we could have someone who both of them are presenting with fertility issues, but someone might have a more anxious presentation, someone might have a more depressive presentation. And it's about working through those thoughts to, I suppose, heal and to make peace with those thoughts, which will then uh, bring us into a better physiological state to cope with the fertility. Yeah, I, I think uh, I explained it very well there. Well Thanks very much. Thanks very much. So that's a big concern to be had when they look at it from a psychological perspective. Yeah, yeah. And then I thought, well, I thought uh, just to give, I suppose, a bit more of an understanding from us, because, because a lot of people wonder, well, how can a psychologist help me with fertility? Um, I think that's really important to touch on is that people think that it's just, it's, it's just a physiological process. It's just the egg and the sperm going together and, and everything should work. And I suppose, I want to give it a greater depth and, and, and acknowledge that fertility is, is so much more than just a physiological uh, reaction or connection uh, that people have. So when people come to see me, it's about working through different belief systems that they may have. Uh, it's working through different experiences that, that, that they may have had. Um, if someone's had PTSD or trauma or an experience that's actually affected them physiologically, whether it be that they have had a miscarriage or whether it be that there has been difficulties around intimacy and connection, then that can also impact uh, how we try to conceive. Um, we also look at things, how, how are belief systems passed down so that psychology comes into play with fertility. With, well, what were you told as a child about babies and were they a hassle or what was the belief system about birthing or what was the belief system around on being a parent? Um, some women might have had fathers who were completely absent. So the core belief that they may be unconscious of is that I'll have to do it all by myself. And so therefore we already have this, um, I suppose, this expectation of the pressure or stress that we may have in parenthood. So mm -hmm. although it may appear that it's not going to have an impact, it certainly may be a psychological stumbling block for us to proceed any further. So I suppose I like to think of it as clearing the air and unhooking some, some psychological baggage that we may have. Yeah, yeah I, think, I, think I think a lot of people think that it's just about, about helping, you helping, you, helping you calm, helping you calm down, 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 but you've explained a lot more than that. that. Yeah, that's right. It is a lot more than, I, believe me, I, I do agree that there is a need for stress minimisation and relaxing, but I certainly think that there's so many more layers to the psychological impact on fertility. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we hear a lot about mindfulness lately, and that's, I guess, a big thing in the media, whether it's about fertility or just out of the way of being. To discuss a little bit more about that fertility and what you've done. Yeah, sure. Um, so mindfulness and, and ACT, what we call in psychology, so acceptance and commitment therapy, are, uh, are probably two, two sides of the same coin. So it's about actually um, being present at this point in time, being present in this moment. Now, I think it's important to acknowledge that the fertility journey can actually be quite stressful. And to sit in that space is, is even more stressful, to acknowledge that the, um, the pain and the difficulty and um, the isolation. Um, there's so many feelings that go, that go with the, the experience of infertility. So mindfulness and, and ACT are about actually acknowledging that we have those feelings, not actually pushing them aside and saying, no, 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 that's okay, I'll just continue on. I just have to move through this. It's, we've, got, we've got a plan, we have something in place, it's all physical and this is what has to happen. And I think that to ignore the fact that we have emotions that go with these difficult experiences is, is, to, um, is to not give ourselves 
or honour ourselves and give ourselves the space to acknowledge that it can be hard. So mindfulness and ACT are about saying that, yes, I, I suppose like the saying goes, it's, it's like your mind is the sky and your emotions and clouds are the weather. So allow them to move through you. Allow, to feel, allow yourself to feel them, but don't unpack and stay and live there. And that's what uh, mindfulness, I suppose, relates to the fertility experience or infertility experience. Yeah, it's a really great analogy there. It's about accepting your emotions and, and not just wallowing, wallowing them and them staying there and unpacking your baby. I'm going to give you feedback. Is that just, that just me? me? Um, I'm not getting any feedback. No, no, okay. No, okay. No, okay. No, okay. No, 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 double. No. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> so... I guess more specifically, how, how do we gain a better understanding of what is impacting us and what is our, our stumbling block to achieving our baby dream? So what in sessions when people come to see me, I suppose it's about understanding um, how, how we can approach uh, the experience that we're having. So uh, I suppose it's like the eight old ad age old adage of a negative mind will never give you a positive life. It's about acknowledging that, yeah, everything isn't going to be butterflies and rainbows, but how do we want to perceive what's actually going on? And that's how we're going to shift and change the outcome, I suppose you would say. I like to challenge people in sessions to say, the situation is happening anyway, so how would you like to approach it? Um, we can look at it physiologically. I've broken my leg. How can you approach a broken leg? You can either wallow and sit and get upset and be angry or resentful or remorseful or whatever has gone on in relation to the broken leg. Or we can actually say to ourselves, well, okay, I've got a broken leg, but what can I do about that now? How can I approach this broken leg? Same as fertility. The experience is happening. Unfortunately, we're, we're in this situation of, of finding it hard to fall pregnant. And so it's about us saying, well, how can I improve the situation with my mind and how can I improve my situation with the thoughts by how I approach it, whether it is that I take control, whether it is that I take, make a plan. I talk to people a lot about you plan for your finances or you plan for travel and a lot of that, the emotion that goes with that is all joyful and, and exciting and you can see the end in sight. And I think I want people to acknowledge that fertility can be that way as well. Plan who you want on your team. Plan how you would like it to evolve. Doesn't mean that it necessarily follows that plan, but certainly gives you the headspace that you're in somewhat of control of the situation. Um, it feels like you're participating. It feels like you're taking responsibility of decisions that are being made. So that's how our mindset can have a huge impact on, on how we approach the situation. We can, we can dwell on it. We can get angry. We can... Uh, get upset that people are taking over or we can actually be assertive and say, well, no, this is my journey and, and this is my baby that I'm going to have. How do I take control of that and how do I participate in to the best of my ability with how I'm going to perceive what's going on? Great. I mean, you discussed before, I guess, how it is a physiological process that the mind does affect the body. When you were talking about the different mindsets, say that stress, the anxiety mindset, to approaching it with more of a positive mindset, what changes are occurring in the body? I know I heard you talk about adrenal fatigue once before, which can occur, I guess, when you're in a lot of anxiety and stress, which can happen um, when you're trying to conceive um, IVF or, or naturally, really. So what are the different, different physiological processes that are happening? Obviously, mentally, we're feeling better, but well, what's happening in our body when we can change that mindset? Yeah. So, again, it's a biopsychosocial model. I feel like I'm, I'm saying this quite frequently to a lot of people. It's understanding that it's all interconnected and you can pull it apart to treat it, but it, to actually approach it and get the right perspective of what's going on, you have to look at every area. So someone may present with a physiological condition like adrenal fatigue or someone, it, when people come to see me, they present with I'm upset and I'm angry that I'm not conceiving. So then we then work back, okay, well, what might be happening? A lot of the time, as you just touched on, I have so many women that are high-functioning women that come and see me that have adrenal fatigue that will never be diagnosed by doctors. There isn't a test that says, there's a continuum, okay, you have a little bit of adrenal fatigue, you have a, a, a lot of adrenal fatigue. It's basically 
you have problems with your adrenal, which is a disease, or you don't have any problems whatsoever. So it's about getting in touch with other professionals like a naturopath or, or someone who can do tests or, or asking your doctor to have more thorough investigations to work out what's actually physiologically going on with our body. So with adrenal fatigue, it's, there's a lot of cortisol pumping through our body, so that's related to stress. There's a decrease in progesterone a lot of the time, and that's either related to um, not getting enough sleep or it's related to hormone imbalance from any other life events that might be happening for us. So it's about understanding that that's the physiological component. Psychologically, we then go into, well, why did they present this way in the first place? Why may they have gotten the adrenal fatigue? A lot of the time, these people that come through my door are type of A personalities. So it's, they're quite independent. They're, they're go get them. They're, I can do this. Um, I don't need any help. Very, very, um, very confident in their own abilities, which is fantastic. The problem is, these though, that they load up their plate too much. And so then that's how they get the exhaustion going on, where they're cutting corners with their sleep and not getting enough. They may be um, propping themselves up with coffee or sugar. Um, and then the belief systems that go with that, as I said, touch on the things like, I can do this myself. No, I have to push through this. And so there, that's when I come into play. So they go off and do the other areas that need to be physiologically worked on. And then I come in and say, well, okay, this isn't sustainable. It, you will burn yourself out. You won't be able to conceive if you continue on the trajectory that you're on. So then we have to work on, well, it's about boundaries. What, what do we need to say no to? It's about saying, I have to put myself as a priority with self-care. I have to, um, I have to say no to things that aren't in my best interest. And so that's how we work on the belief systems that go with the presentation, if that makes sense. So that's how our mind and body connect. You present with a physiological difficulty and then we have to work through the process of well, what's, what are the thought patterns that are in place to make us have this behaviour? It's, it's back actually to the basics of CBT. Our thoughts affect our actions, which then affect our behaviour. So we're going back to the start. Our behaviour, they come to me with a certain behaviour. I'm not able, able to conceive. I've, I've had these unhelpful, supportive, unsupportive behaviours and we have to get back to the roots of, well, what are the thoughts in place and why do you think those things so that we can change that and not put ourselves under either so much stress, so much pressure, so much worry or so much whether it's perception of sadness or feeling like the world's against them. I don't know. It's, it, as I said, individual fingerprints for individual people. So it depends who presents to me. Yeah, I mean, it's good to pe for people to see people like yourself and understand what is their motivator and why are they pushing themselves too hard and why do they have that belief? And also to realise that it's not just, I guess, in the mind. It's not about relaxing. It's about, like, if you are particularly stressed, I mean, probably some of the things that you would find is, is an, ov an ov ovulation. People will stop ovulating. Because when we would talk about, and I mean, as everyone who's listened to these before knows that I believe in being the best mum starts well before birth. You're already nourishing all that DNA, all that special egg and sperm um, that are going to create that baby. So you're already nourishing your baby well before they even connect. And if you don't have enough nutrients available through stress, uh, whether it be adrenal fatigue or just these bad behaviours, then you're not actually nourishing the egg. And also um, a big question we often get is, is people with irregular cycles um, or not ovulating at all, which is obviously if your mind's not baby ready, your your body's not baby ready either. Is that something you see quite a, quite a bit as well with some of the, I guess, irregular cycles and lack of ovulation when people are in that state? Definitely, definitely. There's a high correlation between the level of stress and the cycle that they present with. Uh, and and even, um, even for myself, I know that I automatically, I learned early on that if, if I was stressed, it would push my cycle out or would bring it forward. And so I think this is really important in getting people to understand how the impact of stress even, as you said, impacts the basic physiological response of your cycle. And that's a big factor I actually, I suppose a psychological thing that I talk about is, is it relates or it's an interplay between your actual physiological flow and flowing with, with life. So I say to people, I get them to check in. 
And it's about saying, well, are you in flow? Are you in flow? Yes, physiologically you're not in flow because the cycle isn't regular, but are you actually in flow with life? Are you pushing up against life? Are you pushing too hard in life? That means you're not flowing. So flowing is about being, that's when I bring up the whole idea about peace, being at peace with where you're at right now. That's how you get in flow with life. And so I use a lot of the analogies that physiologically people present with that then there is an actual psychological component to that. So I find that words are a very, very good connection to how we're sitting with things. So if we are having lots of cramps and, um, and uh, feeling a lot of pain, it's about really working through what pain are we, might we, we be holding on to, what might be stressing us out. And our body, when we are stressed, does there is research to show that our body reacts um, with a higher a feeling of pain when we are stressed. When we're calmer, we're able to, to deal with a lot more, um, have a higher pain threshold. I mean, even birthing um, studies show that, that when you're calmer, when you're trying to birth, it uh, has a, a much better outcome. Yeah. Yeah, it's really important that that sort of analogy for people as well, that it, it does actually have, have an impact on your pain response. So if you are having PMT and those sort of symptoms, and I think a lot of people with their menstrual cycles do put up with a lot of symptoms. And as they think as long as we're pushing out an egg each month, then that should be okay. Um, and in the reality, we don't just want to push out an egg. Um, a, we want that to be the healthiest, most nourished egg possible, which is going to be much better in a, a calmer environment. And also you want the best environment uh, for that baby to actually grow and nurture. I mean, the egg can get fertilized and if you don't have a great nourished, thick, healthy lining of your uterus, which uh, is greatly impacted by stress, um, you probably get patients yourself and you know, get the thin lining or may have um, either weak periods um, and, and, and scanty periods or else quite the opposite. You can get some really heavy periods uh, because they go too long and the, the wall can build up, which neither of those things are conducive to, you may get the egg fertilized, but really implanting it and getting a good grip there and, and not getting nourished um, from day dot. So you know, stress we talk about is, is not just about, you know, all the fluffy meditation and, and, and feeling good about yourself. I mean, that helps you get through it. But I think I know when I've spoken to people, there's, there's a mindset that seeing a psychologist just helps me get through it, helps me cope. Um, but hopefully, yeah, from what you've discussed, I think we've really broken down that, that myth. It's not just about helping you cope, although that's a great part of it. It's about really it being connected. Um, I love that analogy you used, actually. I think that's really important that, that it is all things working together to support that um, healthy egg and healthy sperm. I mean, this obviously goes for men as well. We're talking largely about women here too, but um, do you see, I mean, obviously the couples together, do you, do you work with the males on the health of sperm as, as well as, as the females? Yeah, yeah, definitely. A lot of the time though, I, I admittedly, <laughs> the information goes through the woman. So, so yeah, I think that's why I naturally gravitate to the woman because, yeah, they, they do tend to do most of the work in this respect. <laughs> so a lot of the time the woman will come into the session and then she'll talk about her husband or partner and she'll say, oh, well, this is going on for their work or I'm finding that they're not eating properly or I'm finding that their sleep habits are really poor. And so what ends up happening is, is you start to work through a few strategies with their partner who then filters it through to them because a lot of the time men don't actually like to come into sessions and and this is what I suppose I really am, am keen on is breaking down the, the wall which I think I've, I've heard you speak about before and with other people on the webinars is that it's important that it's males and females are both making this baby. It's not just a female problem and so I've seen, don't get me wrong, I do see couples in sessions. I, I can definitely... Um, I'm thinking now and I've definitely got a few couples on my list so the male does come into the session and take responsibility of what he needs to do as well, even if he thinks he's just going to support the woman. Um, but a lot of them, it can be work stress as well and just the impact of the sleep on, on their sperm quality and their diet or if they're not getting enough exercise. And so even though it might not sound like it's a psychological component, Again, biopsychosocially, it's about what are the behaviours that you need to put in place to create the optimal environment that you're talking about. And so if they're not doing things to stress, uh, 
for stress reduction like exercise or, or healthy eating, then the men need to get on top of that just as, as much. I also find another psychological component that comes into play during sessions is about um, whether the male is actually on the same page as the female. Sometimes I've had, had couples come in and, and they're actually psychologically not particularly present. And so it's like, oh, well, if that's what she wants, and, and I'm like, well, no, it, you both have to be wanting this baby. It's not, oh, well, I'll come in if I need to and I'll participate if I need to. You actually have to be conscious about this conception. It's about both being on the same page. Someone can't be flying around with their job and, and only present on the day to con trying to conceive and then think, oh, well, this is going to happen. The relationship has to be a cup that actually supports the pregnancy as well. So that's another big dynamic of where the male has to join that I suppose the scenario is that it's understanding that communication and the relationship plays a massive foundation in in developing a good environment that you talk about for trying to conceive so that um, I, I like to say to a lot of people and sometimes it might sound a bit out there but it's like sending the, the baby sending their parents off to parenting classes before it arrives it wants their parents to get in line and get organized before it comes and so it's about making sure that they are investing in each other so they've got enough energy to then invest in the baby as well absolutely i think we're so focused on getting pregnant but it's not just about getting pregnant you really want the healthiest baby possible not only so that you can carry the baby to term but, but but so you do get the healthiest outcomes for your child as well and, and I've, I've mentioned this before, but research is now showing that, that the nutrition and the nourishment you provide prior to conceiving and during the first, I guess, the initial early stages can have a greater impact on the long-term health of your baby than your genetics. I mean, you have the opportunity to switch genes on and off um, and really provide your baby with the best genetic material you can um, during this critical stage. And I know I, I struggled with fertility myself and I try to look at it as a positive now. I'm now blessed with two beautiful children. Um, and I, I look at the fertility journey as a positive because it really did enable me that time to, to go to parenting school, uh, for want of a better term. As you said, I think that's a, it's a great analogy there that I, I was actually able to go, okay, well, think about this um, more calmly and, and create the healthiest egg, create the healthiest sperm, and, and hopefully we, we created the, the healthiest children. Exactly. That's exactly right. And and there's even research to suggest um, they've looked at, uh, there's, a, there's a, f a film that's called In Utero, and they actually looked at some studies on on uh, survivors, uh, the descendants of survivors of World War II, and found that the genetics were different. Different genes are switched on and off in relation to how they then react to stress and food, so yeah. that the descendants actually uh, had metabolisms that were used to have not having a lot of food and yet that's how they were ending up overweight is because the genes that were switched on were about um, what what they were handed down and so this is it's clear evidence to show that what we're actually conceiving with the, the health as you said of the baby of the egg and sperm is actually where we are right now it's it's not about yes it is about what your child does eventually but it we have to do we have so much impact that we can um, that we can, uh, I suppose, have pos have a positive influence on it. That why not? Well, I always ask myself, why not? Why can why do we not be more proactive about preventative health than the consequence of later? Absolutely, it's about providing the best foundation. And I often use the analogy. I mean, we spend weeks, if not months, decorating the baby's nursery when we are pregnant. Then your arrival, you know, everything goes up. The curtains where you got all the decoration. But really, the, the most important nursery your baby will ever have is the one inside you. But we, we do little to prepare that. We often think, oh, it's just about getting that everything spurned together and then we'll be fine. But no, we really want to create that really wonderful, nourishing nursery for that baby to be really receptive into. And that is via social, so oh, that's us all of, I actually forget that terminology now, but that actually great acronym that you, that you put together there because it actually means we are all encompassed and I actually saw that video that you were talking about in relation to the um, World War II, I think it was, victims. And it is about not only their physical state, which is obviously the lack of food, but also their psychological state. And it was fascinating to discover that these people, I guess, more were more resilient 
in a way, both psychologically and with, with the aspect of food, were more um, immune to famine because their ancestors had to deal with that. So, yeah, what we deal with both from a psychological and a physical perspective um, does impact the health of our child and their genetic outcomes. And we're so focused on the physical that hopefully today we've been able to, to clarify what is involved in the psychological and it's not just about calming yourself down and enabling you to cope or it's all in your head it is really um, a lot more than that so i think just lastly can we touch on some things that that people can do themselves um who are listening to this and thinking okay i fall into some of those categories i i am a bit stressed i i do have some mindsets going on what are just some, some basic overall principles that people can can do to, to start improving their psychological fertility health yeah, sure. So obviously it's about stress minimization. Well, I'm not going to to sugarcoat it. It's it has an impact. So our body it's again touching on the biopsychosocial framework. It affects your cells. So stress affects your cells, your hormones, the oxidize, oxidization in your body, inflammation. It, it whether we like it or not, stress is having an impact. Yes, I, I heard I watched Gina's uh, webinar. And she said, yes, stress can have a good, um, can have uh, a role to play, but certainly if it's ongoing, and as she highlighted, if, if it continues on and it's sustained, then we have to do something to address it. It's not going to produce a good, ha a good and happy outcome. Yeah. So from a psychological perspective, when we are stressed, it's about the overwhelm, it's about the not coping, it's about maybe at times triggering depression or anxiety, it's about... It might trigger thoughts of guilt, um, isolation. Um, socially, again, then it affects our withdrawal. It affects relationship issues. It affects work problems. And then ultimately, all affects fertility and conception. So that's how stress has an impact. Psychologically, then what do we have to do? I say to people, yeah, we have strategies that I offer. Without doubt, I could list a whole heap of strategies to work with stress. My key is what is your stress minimization strategy. You have to find what works for you. It's no point in me saying go off to yoga and Pilates and you're like, are you serious? I'm not getting into all those bending positions. I prefer to go to the gym or go for a run. So it's about you identifying what is your protocol, what is your treatment plan, and you have to stick to that. You have to be disciplined enough to say, I'm a priority and I have to minimize my stress. So working through the different strategies that that may be. And it is those some of those fluffy things of, yes, do some meditation, uh, go for a shower. Um, people don't realise that a stressful factor is actually the food you eat as well. So a lot of the time people will come in to see me and they're having a couple of coffees a day. And I'm like, you have to realise that the caffeine impacts your body, that you are triggering different stimulants uh, throughout your throughout your cells, that you're going to have a reaction. Your body thinks it's under stress. So you have to you have to say to yourself, I need to cut out that coffee or I need to have an alternative so that I'm not sending those chemicals through my body. Uh, sugar also has another impact that stresses our body out. So you have to realise that you're triggering these spikes all the time and then coming down from them. So, of course, that's going to affect your emotions. So I think people need to realise that it's not just about, okay, am I in a stressful environment? It's about what stress are you putting on your body for it to have to react to. Um, it's about the perception of stress. So I think it's important, I say to a lot of people, that you have to really reframe what you're going through, reframe the situation. I don't want to simplify it too much, but it's, it's similar to the glass half full or half, half empty. So you can go around and saying, yeah, this is all very negative and... I can't see any positives in any of it. Or you can actually say, what's the blessing in all of it? As you said, the posit what's the positive I can get out of this negative experience? What can I, what can I get from this? I, you decided to take control and say, I'm going to make the best quality egg I can make and focus on, on my husband's best quality sperm that he can make and, and how do I make my, the best environment I can make? And that's what, where a lot of people that I find success, they actually take control of their situation and say, Okay, what can I do? Crap situation, really horrible. I'm finding it hard, but there has to be something that I can grab onto here. The hope and the faith is a big emotion and a big value that helps get a lot of people through. Yeah, 
Yeah, great. I agree. It's, it's not just that they cope better in relation to that. It's that they actually are providing better hormones for their body. They're, they are actually providing a better environment and a better quality egg and sperm for their baby. So I think that's a, that's a, a good thing for people to be aware of, that the stress factor or the, the psychological factor isn't a sideline that's, I guess, the icing on the cake to, to the rest of the real stuff that's going on. It is just as important and, and a big significant part of that real physical stuff that's going on and can be, I guess, fundamental depending on, on what your, your issue or background is. Um, and if you do think um, your yeah, stress is uh, quite a factor, as you mentioned, Gina, um, we had a discussion with Gina about stress and fertility, which you can find on the website where she goes in into detail about the implications um, of stress on uh, fertility outcomes and how you can overcome that and also talks about um, the meditation and, and changing mindsets as well. Mm. So. The other important point I wanted to touch on is also people may, may, be, may not think it's an issue, but I think it's important to touch on that it's about being clear about what your framework is, what your mental uh, core beliefs are. Because a lot of the time they can have an un unconscious impact. We touched on it before, but it's about clearing some of the stuck or stagnant energy. With with the trauma-based uh, work that I've done, and, and just people may think, well, how does fertility and trauma relate? relate? As I touched on before, it's about that the cell remembers. There is research to show that our cells remember trauma. So my, I suppose I'm extending the thought pattern here is that our cells remember what's going on. Our cells remember stress. Our cells remember psychological events. So it's about being clear about if we may have had an experience, a sexual experience that may have, may have been quite difficult, or we may have had a termination, or we may have had a difficult um, parent-child relationship, whether that be a mother-daughter relationship, whether it be that we um, we were always told that, um, oh, you were so hard as as to be pregnant with and, and my God, my birth was just terrible with you. And so you take on this subconscious belief system of, of well, pregnancy must be hard or that that I was a really um, problematic child or whatever it may be, that some of those thought systems and um, beliefs have to be actually worked through to clear the air, to clear, clear the cellular memory of the negativity that may go through with some of these life events. So people may think that it's a long um, bow to draw, but I find day in and day out throughout my practice that people have different core beliefs and they are actually hanging over and hooking in to some of the fertility issues. And as soon as I clear the air with that, then they're actually finding that they're getting some success. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. I mean, people do need to get right back to the basics, as you said initially, and go back to those core beliefs that we may actually be unaware of. I know when I was looking at core beliefs, you kind of take them as, well, that's that's just how it is, isn't it? And that's almost enlightening to realise, no, that's just a belief I've held for a long time and this is the reasons why that belief is actually a stumbling block to, to where I want to get to. So, as you said, helping to, to clear that belief and realise that, that isn't something that you need to cling to, that there are different sort thought processes that may be more conducive to achieving the outcome that you are that you are looking for. So taking the time to to look at being mindful and and taking the time out for self-care is something yes. that I know type A personalities are terrible at. And I know even, even now in saying that, I'm like, I need to do that more now. But I was very aware of um, when I was trying to conceive. And it is a difficult thing to do to prioritise yourself. Um, and I know I found the best. I, I still struggle to prioritise yourself. Seems very difficult uh, for some people to do. But you know, you're not just prioritising yourself anymore. Yes. And everyone says, okay, when I get pregnant, I'll be really good and I'll be really mindful and I'll de-stress. You're already carrying that genetic material. You're already carrying your baby. You're already nourishing your baby. So it starts now. You know, all, yeah. that, all that mindfulness, all that thing, that, that precious energy that you're going to conserve to really nourish your baby, um, you've already start. You really need to start now, not just when you, when you conceive and, and have your baby. And that's going to not only as it, it helps you take control of the situation, not just to go, oh, poor me, I really am stuck in this, it's really a terrible situation, which it is, where it's, it's totally valid response and I, I yeah, I absolutely know um, that it is easy to fall into that pattern. But to then shift that mindset about, okay, this is something that we are stuck in, as you said, it, it's, it's not going to change, well, it's not changing with the current way I'm doing it, uh, working at it, 
and you can't take a type A personality response and just schedule more things in and work harder. <laughs> It all is about, okay, working out, okay, there's something blocking here. What is that? And looking at it from a psychological perspective can actually help to unblock those stumbling blocks, particularly for people with fertility issues that there are a lot of people with, you know, there is no, I guess, fundamental reason why you are not conceiving, which can be extremely frustrating. And that can often indicate that there is, some sort of psychological aspect um, to it that may be causing a blockage for you. Yes, definitely. Perfectly said. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I know we we definitely share the same philosophy um, on on that mind body connection and its relation to fertility, and hopefully we've helped to um, clear a lot of those those myths for people today and help people to I guess be more aware. Of, of the mind-body connection and how important um, it is in the physical process and how interconnected they really are. So thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to provide us with this, this fabulous information today, Kath. I know it's been um, great for me and I'm sure great for everyone viewing as well. My pleasure. I've enjoyed really being here and being able to talk to people in a bit more depth about what I do um, because it is just a small bit player at this point in time, but I think it's important to really start to shift the paradigm uh, about making it much more holistic about fertility. Excellent. Well, uh, to view these webinars and more, um, there is obviously um, Gina Fox I spoke with, who is a natural fertility specialist with a master's in reproductive medicine. I also under discussion with um, Gina on stress and fertility, so jump on the website and check that out. We also um, have other discussions with um, Dr. Stroy about preconception health um, and recently with Angela Highwood, um, who is an internationally renowned um, naturopath and natural fertility specialist, speaking about miscarriage, which um, I know often goes hand in hand with that um, stress um, process. So for those and for more information um, about conceiving and carrying a healthy baby, jump on the Conceive Baby website, conceivebaby.com.au and be sure to sign up for the webinars and join our community. I'll speak to you soon.